Hello everyone, welcome again to Modeling Methods and Mechanical Engineering. <clears throat> and today we're going to continue again our discussion on partial differential equations and we are going to now shift gears into uh, numerical techniques, modeling techniques to approximate the solution of such, of such equations. Uh, we've been looking at analytical techniques such as the method of separation of variables and the method of superposition that along with the method of separation of variables can can be used to uh, solve a wider range of problems. But we discussed the situation in which you might actually end up with a problem that doesn't have an analytical solution, a problem that, that for example, has um, time-dependent boundary conditions or time-dependent generation term in the governing equation. Um, and you would need special techniques to address them analytically, such as the variation of parameters or Green's functions or Duhamel's theorem. Um, so, the idea is, as we did for ordinary differential equations, let's just start from scratch and, and try to find a solution of the problem in terms of a discretized set of terms instead of a, an algebraic representation in terms of a power series or anything like that. So, let's see how this works. So, this is modeling methods in ME. And the method that we are going to be addressing today is the finite <coughs> differences or difference method. Some people cite it uh, in plural and some people in singular. So finite difference or finite differences method. And this is or the approximation. of solutions of PDEs, PDEs, which can be either initial value problems or boundary value problems. So as we did in the case of ordinary differential equations, we are going to formulate this technique based on transient problems. So, so essentially formulate them as initial value problems. Now, first of all, recall that the Taylor series approximation of first derivatives, first derivatives. We use the Taylor series approximation to come up with an, uh, a way to approximate, for example, the first derivative with respect to time of a field variable phi. And in order to do so, we let Tn, which is the discretized time, be equal to n times delta t. Rather than uh, formulating time as a continuous representation, we formulated a discrete set of steps and where n goes from 0 all the way to n and being the final step. And all separated by a time step size delta t, which we've actually managed to keep constant. n <coughs> time steps of size delta t such that t goes from some value zero all the way to tf to some final time all right and uh, we had shown that an approximation of the first derivative of t at a time level n will be approximately phi at n minus phi at n minus one divided by delta t, and we know that this approximation occurs in an error of the order delta t, so it's order delta t accurate. Okay, so this is called a backward, backward difference approximation, approx of the first derivative. So we're going to refer to it as BDA, backward difference approximation. Why do we call it a backward difference approximation? Well, because in order to determine the derivative or to approximate the derivative of function phi at time level n, we are using the value of the variable or the function phi at time level n and the value of the function phi at time level n minus 1, so one time level behind. So that's why we call this backward difference in approximation. We can also manipulate the algebra on the Taylor series approximation and end up with an expression that shows that we can approximate 
the derivative of phi with respect to time at time level n is phi at n plus 1 minus phi at n divided by delta t. So this is also order delta t accurate. And as you can see, this is or should be referred as a forward difference. Difference approximation of the first derivative. Forward difference approximation. So in order to determine or to approximate the value of the derivative of phi at time level n, we use the value of phi at the next time level, forward in time. Or we can also say that the phi dt at n could be approximated as phi at n plus 1 minus phi at n minus 1 divided by 2 delta t. So with a simple manipulation of the Taylor series approximation of phi, we can end up with these and also show that this is delta t squared accurate. So this one converges to the solution faster. To the Right solution, the error decreases faster. So this is called the central difference approximation, CDA. And remember, all of these is based on the premise that we are discretizing the time domain. Time is now expressed as a discrete collection of values, um, all equidistant, and uh, that go from zero to some final time t. All right. Now, these approximations of, that we've already covered in the section of a numerical approximation of, a, of ordinary differential equations can also apply in space. So these approximations, these approximations can also be implemented in space. What I mean by that is that we can also let xi be equal to i delta x such that i goes from 0 all the way to capital I. So this is a discrete representation of space rather than a continuous representation of space. So again, So I, so there's I space steps of size delta X, which is equal to L divided by I, um, such that X goes from zero to L. So we can do the same thing for delta T. We can say delta T, which is equal to Tf divided by n such that then the t goes from 0 to Tf. In the case of space, x goes from 0 to L. So it's the same exact representation. It's a discrete representation. So this is known as a space discretization. We're going to need to do space and time discretization because now the equation in the field, the field variable depends on space and time. The central difference approximation of the phi dx will look like the phi dx at time step n and at space level i be approximately phi at i plus 1 time level n minus phi at time level n and space level i minus 1 divided by 2 delta x. And this is order delta x square accurate. This is a central difference approximation of the derivative. Similarly, the central difference approximation of the second derivative of the phi dx squared is, so we can manipulate this further and take the 
central differencing approximation of this one, take the central differencing approximation of this one. So if we say the second derivative of these will be the, the derivative of these with respect to space, then this will very simply translate into the second phi dx squared at position i and time location n, time level n, is approximately phi at i plus 1 n minus 2 phi at i n plus phi at i minus 1 at n divided by delta x squared. And this is also order delta x squared accurate. Let me frame these two. This is the derivative of approximation of the first derivative in space, and this is the approximation of the first derivative of the second derivative in, in space. So we can formulate additional forward differencing approximation and backward differencing approximation, a DA, of higher order Derivatives may be easily formulated. Okay, so in case we need it. So for example, when we, we require a forward differencing or backward differencing approximation of the derivative in space of the phi dx, for example, well, when we want to evaluate the derivative at a boundary. We don't have points to the right or to the left of a, of a boundary. And you'll see how do we deal with that in the case of implementation of boundary conditions. All right, so let's go straight to an example and try to implement all of these and see if we can come up with an algorithm that will give us a discrete approximation of the solution based on these finite differencing or this central forward and, and backward differencing approximation of the derivatives. For example, let's go back to the 1D heat diffusion equation. All right, so we have this equation, the second T dx squared is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt xt. And again, this is diffusion equation. This is diffusion of heat because the field variable is the temperature. But this equation applies to diffusion of anything, diffusion of momentum, diffusion of uh, species, diffusion, diffusion of any quantity that can be diffused is governed by this equation. Again, this, there's no generation. And uh, so we have basically a domain. In the x direction, it goes from 0 to L. And what appears to be is a one-dimensional domain that is insulated on the top and the bottom. It also might be insulated around the, peri the, peri the per periphery. So we have a temperature distribution along this one-dimensional bar that changes as a function of time. Here, x goes from 0 to L, and time goes from actually zero to infinity, but we're going to close it at some final time for analysis because in the numerical implementation of these techniques, we have to limit up until when we evaluate things in time. So we're gonna let x, uh, we're gonna discretize x uh, per index i, is i times delta x, such that i goes from zero all the way to i, and delta x is equal to L over capital I. And we're also going to discretize time as Tn, as n times delta t, such that n goes from zero to capital N, and delta t is equal to the final time divided by n. So what we basically have is a representation looks like this. Let's say that we draw time in the y-axis and we draw space in the x-axis and then we have, um, let's say uh, this is uh, some time equals to Tn, 
time equals, so this is Tn minus 1, this is time equal to Tn, this is time equal to Tn plus 1. So different levels. And let's say that at this value, so we have I equals 0. We have a node here, I equal 1. So we have some node i, i plus 1, i minus 1. And then we have i equal big I, right next to it, i equal i minus 1. So these are the nodes. We call the nodes the discretization in space. We call them the nodes at time equal n. Any difference between these two, two consecutive nodes, is the delta x, and we're going to keep that constant. So delta x is the difference between two consecutive nodes, and the difference between two consecutive time levels is delta t. Right, and this is Tn, and then we can draw exactly the same line at Tn plus 1 and at Tn minus 1. So the discretization stays the same as time progresses. So basically, there will be a temperature here. This is the temperature I N. And this will be the temperature I plus 1 N. Well, this will be the temperature I N plus 1. This will be the temperature I minus 1 N plus 1. And you get the idea. This will be the temperature i at n minus 1. This will be the temperature i plus 1 at n minus 1. This will be the temperature i plus 1 at n plus 1. And we need this one too. This will be the temperature at i minus 1 n. And this will be the temperature at i minus 1 n minus 1. All right. So using this what we are going to do is how are we going to take this equation right here and relate it to this grid that there's a grid in space with nodes and that grid in space actually remains constant in time. What we're going to do is use central differencing approximation in space and forward differencing approximation in time to approximate those derivatives on, on that governing equation. So use Central differencing approximation in space and forward differencing approximation in time. And what we'll have is that, let me bring the spring down. Central differencing approximation in space will be Ti plus 1 at time position n minus 2 Ti at time position or time level n plus Ti minus 1 time position n divided by delta x squared should be equal to 1 over alpha. And the forward differencing approximation in time means that we are going to be approximating this at time level n as the temperature at the next time level minus the temperature at i at the current time level divided by delta t. Let's see what we get from this. This is what's called a discretized is PDE. So from here we can solve for this temperature at the next time level, Ti at n plus 1 is equal to Ti at n plus alpha delta t over delta x squared, Ti plus 1 at n minus 2 Ti at n plus Ti minus 1 at n. 
And that's it. Notice that this is a scheme that you can code into an algorithm that is perfectly explicit. If you have the temperature distribution at all the nodes, at all the space nodes, at a time position n, well, starting at time position 0, at time level 0, you know the temperature distribution because you know the initial condition. If you start with that, you can correlate them this way for every node i, then you can get the temperature at the next time level n plus 1. So this is called the explicit finite difference method scheme is explicit. Okay. That means that the solution at point or at node xi at new time level n plus 1 depends only on the solution at neighboring nodes at the previous time level n or at the current time level n. So that means that let's do this graphically. If you have a time level Tn and uh, you have the space discretization i, i plus 1, i minus 1, then you have i equals 0, i equal 1, this will be i equal big i, and this will be i equals i minus 1, and then you have the same representation at the next time level, n plus 1, will be i equals 0, i equal 1, i minus 1, i, i plus 1, i equal i, i equal i minus 1. If you want to know what the solution is here, all you have to do is query what happened in the past. It will be only dependent on the solution on this in its own node and neighboring nodes in the previous time, time level. So this scheme is valid for i equal 1 all the way to i minus 1. You cannot apply this scheme right here and you cannot apply the scheme right here because as you can see if you want to find out the temperature at i equals 0 it will refer to a temperature at i minus 1 which is minus 1, which doesn't exist. There's no node here. So at the end nodes, so every node excluding the end nodes. So at the end nodes, you have to apply the boundary condition. So this equation, basically the, the scheme for the uh, discretization of the governing equation can be applied at interior nodes, and at the end nodes, you apply the discretization of the boundary conditions. So how do we do that? So let's see. At the end nodes, and those are i equals zero, and i equal i, we must apply boundary conditions. BCs. That is, at i equals 0, or 
i equal i. Let's say that we have a first kind, first kind condition, Dirichlet, or force condition. So, in that case, the temperature at some boundary node and t is equal to some t given tb, such that xb is equal to zero or l. Then ti at n plus one is equal to tb. It's as simple as that. So basically the implementation of this type of boundary condition will be to uh, set the temperature of that particular end node, i equals 0 or i equal 1, to the boundary temperature if the boundary temperature is given. So that's straightforward. If you have a second kind condition, let's call it Neumann or natural condition, the normal flux at the boundary node is equal to some QB, some given QB. That means that minus k, the td normal, at xb, is equal to some qb. So we are going to use a forward differencing approximation of dt dx at i equals 0, or a backward differencing approximation of dt dx at i equal i. So obviously if we are on the end node and we want to know and the flux is given and we need to relate the slope of the temperature, we're going to use a forward differencing, uh, forward differencing approximation on this node. But if we're given a flux on the right hand side at x equal l, then we're going to use a backward differencing approximation in space. And at the end of the day, this is going to result in the following. Ti at n plus 1 is equal to Ti plus 1 at n plus 1 or i minus 1. So i plus 1 if, you are, if i is equal to 0 and i minus 1 if i is equal to capital I minus delta x times qb, the given value of the flux, divided by k. So this is how we implement the second kind condition. So if i is equal to 0, it would be t0 is equal to t1 minus delta x qb divided by k. If the flux condition was imposed at x equal l, then this will be t capital I is equal to t capital I minus 1, so note right to the left of it, minus delta x qb over k. And finally, if we have a third kind condition, remember we call this a Robin condition or convective. In this case, it is given by Newton's cooling law, which means which says that the normal flux at the boundary node is equal to H, which is a given quantity, T. Uh, at that boundary node minus t infinity, which is also a given quantity. So this is the film coefficient or heat transfer coefficient, and this is the convective temperature. So this is minus k dt dn at xb is equal to h times t at xb minus t infinity. And remember that xb is the boundary node, either x equals 0 or x equals l. Again, we're going to use a finite differencing, a forward differencing approximation of dt dx at i equals 0, or a backward differencing approximation of dt dx if the convective condition happens to be on the other side at i equal beta i at x equal l. And what's going to end up, what we're going to end up with is t at i at n plus 1 whether this is zero or capital I, the left hand node or the right hand node is T at I plus one 
or I minus 1, depending on whether you're on the left or on the right, plus the B of number times T infinity divided by 1 plus the B of number. I'll write in a minute what the B of number is. such that the B of number is equal to H delta X divided by K. That is the B of number. It's a relationship between the convective coefficient, the film coefficient, and the conduction of the material. So this is how we implement for either of the end nodes, whether we have a first kind, second kind, or third kind condition at either x equals 0 or x equals L. This is how we implement in the scheme, this finite differencing scheme, uh, the end nodes. For the interior nodes, we just implement this one. So it's very simple, this algorithm. We start at, at i equals 0. I'm sorry, at n equals 0, where we know the initial condition. We know the temperature everywhere and all the nodes, including the end nodes, right? And then we say, well, what happens at the next time level? And we sweep this equation for i equal 1 all the way to i minus 1 for all the interior nodes. We sweep it. That, that means that we're going to find out what the temperature is here, 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 everywhere except on the end nodes. Then after we do that, then we use I, any of these three equations on the left and any of these three equations on the right, depending on what type of boundary condition is given, and, um, and then advance in time to the next time level. So let's kind of summarize that simple algorithm. So the solution is started at time t equals 0. That's n equals 0, where the initial condi initial condition is known. So let's say, for example, that we are given the temperature at x comma zero is equal to some t zero, which can be a function of x, right? So basically, t i at n is equal to t zero at x i for i equals 0 all the way to i and n equals 0. Right? So that's how we initialize the array of temperatures, the solution vector, and advance in time explicitly. So we're going to advance this in time explicitly. So, can the approximation be perfectly accurate if delta x and delta t both go to zero? So if we make this discretization as fine as possible, well, this is not possible because of basically two reasons. We've already gone over these in ordinary differential equation when discussing the uh, Euler's method or lunge kutta and so on. First of all, this round off, this is the smallest number or difference that the computer can recognize so you cannot make something infinitely small. In addition to that, if delta x is equal to 0 or delta t is equal to 0, that implies that your number of time steps or your number of space grid points will be equal to infinity. And obviously, you don't have enough time to do anything over an infinite number of uh, iterations. But there's also an, a stability criteria. Stability. There's a term. In the equation, if we look at the 
explicit finite difference in representation of the scheme, there's this term right here. Um, and this term is called the Fourier number. It's a non-dimensional quantity because, as you can see, you're adding temperatures to temperatures times this, so this has to be non-dimensional. Remember that the units of alpha, the diffusivity, is meter squares over second, and that will cancel out the seconds and the delta t and the meter squares and the delta x square. So this is a non-dimensional quantity, and that's basically what it's, what it's basically saying is projecting the solution from the previous time level to the next time level, right? So if that quantity, and we can actually find this out very easily, if the Fourier number alpha delta t over delta x squared, this is called the Fourier number, is larger than 0 0.5, this number must be kept below 0 0.5. So the Fourier number needs to be less than 0 0.5 for the solution to be stable. If not, the solution, although might be theoretically accurate because we might be making delta x very small or delta t very small, but if this ratio here is larger than 0 0.5 or even equal to 0 0.5, the solution would be unstable and will just simply blow up. That means that any noise that is added to the numerical solution at any time level will blow up out of proportions in future time levels. And remember, there's always inherent noise because there's roundup. The computer has an inherent error in representing numbers, right? So that inherent error will actually propagate and will amplify as the solution progresses in time because the diffusion is not able to handle the, the, it's the numerical scheme to capture the diffusion is not able to, to, to handle at the diffusion rate is, is, that, is, uh, that is actually present, which is alpha. Now, we can see this in an example. Let's, uh, let's look uh, at implementing this algorithm in MathCAD so you can see how this business of the stability works out and show very easily how the Fourier number actually, a, a Fourier number larger than 0 0.5, make the solution go um, completely unstable. And you get something that's uh, unrecognizable, something that doesn't make any sense. Um, this can be proven uh, very easily by doing something called Fourier analysis, which is in, you, you introduce the solution as a sine wave, for example, and then evaluate and then uh, propagate that sine wave in time using this algorithm. And you will see that the uh, propagation of the sine wave is not confined. In theory, if the solution is diffusing, the, the diffusing, the sine waves will actually evolve diffusively to nothing, it should diffuse away to nothing. But if the Fourier number is larger than 0 0.5, it would actually amplify. You get a positive amplification term. So let's look at an example. And this is a an example that we already solved last class. Is this one-dimensional diffusion equation where the initial condition is given by T0 and the boundary condition we have on the left at x equals 0 we have q equals 0 so that translates into the t dx at x equals 0 is equal to 0 so it's a homogeneous second kind condition and the other condition says that q at x equal l is equal to h times t minus t infinity t at x equal l. So that means, and we made t infinity equal to zero, so the t dx at x equal l plus h over k times t at x equal l is equal to zero. So those are the two conditions. The second kind on the left and a third kind on the right. We already solved this problem, so we have an analytical solution in terms of infinite series. The analytical solution is that t at x comma t is equal to the summation from n equal 1 to infinity cn times the cosine of lambda n x e to the minus alpha lambda n squared t. Where these eigenvalues 
tangent of lambda and L is equal to H over K divided by lambda N. So this is what we found, the relationship of these eigenvalues. Well, the eigenvalue problem for a case where you have a second condition on the left and the third kind condition on the on the right, I think it's case number four on the table, and this is the eigenfunction, this is the relationship of the eigenvalue. And the norm, Cn, will be 2 h squared plus lambda n squared times L h squared plus lambda n squared plus h integral from 0 to L d0 of x, whatever we impose d0 to be dx. All right. And we are going to program these analytical solution, compare analytical solution to a explicit, explicit finite difference method approximation And we're going to do it right away on MathCAD. So we are going to program this analytical solution. We are going to also program these eigenvalues, which we've done before, because uh, this is a, a, an implicit representation of the eigenvalues. Um, so we have that algorithm to, to find the, uh, in, the intersection between this function and this function um, at different values of uh, n. And then we are going to use that to calculate the in, uh, constants of integration for the what we call the analytical solution, uh, which is this power series representation of the solution. And then we're going to compare that to the explicit finite difference in numerical approximation of the solution. So let's see. Go to MathCAD. I've already programmed this for you. So we're going to let L be equal to 1. We're going to let K be equal to 1. So this, the, the size of the domain is 1 meter or yard or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's not dimensional. K is equal to 1. In the thermal diffusivity, we're going to make it 10 to the minus 3. It's usually a small value because remember, it's the film coefficient. I'm sorry, it's the uh, alpha, uh, alpha is uh, uh, density, heat capacity, or conductivity by, by density in the specific heat. Rho over C, uh, I'm sorry, K over Rho C. And it's usually a small value in solids, that is, um, where the density is, uh, for example, the density of water is 1,000 uh, uh, meters, uh, 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. Um, so, for example, the, the density of, uh, of steel is in the order of uh, uh, 10,000 kilograms per meter cube, depending on the steel, and then that will make the denominator of alpha very large. We're going to start with an initial condition, that uh, parabola. So we're going to say at time equals zero, the t0x is equal to this parabola that goes from zero at x equals zero to zero at x equal l, and at x equal l over two, it will cancel out. Um, so we'll have l over two times l over two is l over four, l square over four, um, the 4 and the 4 cancel out, and the L square and the L square cancel out, so we have 100 degrees at the center of the domain. So imagine a domain from 0 to L that is initially heated up so that it's 0 at the ends and it's 100 in the middle and it's perfectly parabolic in between. Okay, We're going to make the uh, the flux on the left-hand side at, at x equals 0 equals 0, so it's exactly the same problem that we're solving in this case. We're going to make the temperature at T infinity at x equal l uh, equal to zero, so homogeneous on the left and homogeneous on the right, we are going to make the film coefficient equal to one, and therefore capital H, which is H divided by K, is equal to one. This is the algorithm that we have discussed before to find the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues is just the intersection between the left and the right. The left is the tangent of uh, lambda L, and, uh, and the right is the H divided by lambda. So when these two actually change sign when the 
these two actually meet each other, we call that an eigenvalue. We escape this particular uh, conditional uh, loop and then store that into eigenvalue lambda n and advance the value, the value of i by, by one, or the value of n by one. So at the end, we're gonna we're gonna find a hundred of these eigenvalues. We're gonna, we're gonna say that infinity is equal to hundred. Okay, so we are going to truncate the series after a hundred terms. So this is a uh, the result of the implementation of this algorithm is an array of 101, so from zero, well, this is a zero term, it doesn't matter, uh, it's 100 eigenvalues. All right, so the um, constants of integration, as I say, uh, there's a zero to infinity of these, Cn is the inverse of the norm of this particular eigenvalue problem times the integral from zero to L of the initial condition times the eigenfunction, which is the cosine of lambda n times x dx. And the general and the solution, the particular solution of this problem is the summation from n equal 1 to infinity of cn times the uh, eigenfunction cosine of lambda nx e to the minus alpha lambda n squared times d. Okay, so that should give you the solution in time and space. So if I want to um, find out what the solution at, uh, for example, in the middle of the domain, L over 2, comma 0 is, well, that's simple. It should be 100. It should not be 99.951. .9 it should be exactly 100. So it's, it, this basically means that we are not evaluating, we're truncating the series too early. There should be more, more terms in the series. This should be exactly 100 because this should actually replicate the initial condition. But if I want to know what happens after, let's say, one second, now the temperature keeps going down after two seconds. It keeps going down. And after, let's say, a thousand seconds, the temperature is 32 degrees. So as you can see, we start with a parabola. And then that parabola starts diffusing down, 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 until we actually reach equilibrium, the asymptotic solution. The equilibrium might not actually be found at temperature equals zero. It could. Well, in this case, the convective temperature on the right is equal to zero, so eventually everything will go down to zero. So technically, at time equal to infinity, the solution should be zero, and there it is. It goes down to zero. We'll plot these in, in space and time to, to show. So, so let's say that we're interested in knowing the solution between zero and a thousand seconds, and we are going to discretize space into 10 nodes, 11 nodes, from zero to 10. So the nodal discretization, and space discretization delta x is equal to L over i. So if we have uh, 10 space steps, so 11 nodes, every, uh, they will be separated by 0 0.1. And we are going to discretize space that way from uh, i with an index i from 0 to i, capital I, so that xi is i times delta x. And we're going to discretize time using 100 time steps. Um, where each time step has size tf divided by n, so 10 seconds. So if our final time of evaluation is 1,000 seconds, our delta t is equal to 10. So the discretization of time goes from with index n from 0 to n, and tn is n delta t. Now, the beyond number, which is h delta x over k, is 0 0.1. This will be important in the evaluation of the uh, boundary conditions on the right hand side because we have a third kind boundary condition but more importantly the Fourier number which is the number that would actually determine the stability of these scheme of the explicit scheme alpha delta t over delta x squared notice that it's equal to one and according to our theory if Fourier numbers is larger than 0 0.5 this will render the solution unstable and might be accurate but over time these there will be an amplification of the error that will actually grow out of uh, out of uh, level and it will render the solution useless. This is the explicit um, representation of the solution. Very simple. This is the entire algorithm. So basically, what we're doing is we're setting up an array that is two dimensional: t of i and n, uh, i representing the index of space, n representing the index of time. The first thing that we do is in a loop that goes from zero to i, we fill out the zeroth position of this array using the initial condition. So we know what the initial condition is. We know the temperature at every node i at time position n equals zero. 
And now we are going to loop from n equals 0 to n equal n minus 1. So we're going to loop over all time stuffs. So we are going to first use the explicit finite differencing approximation of the partial differential equation, which is valid for all the interior nodes. So for i going from 1 to i minus 1, so those are all the interior nodes, we apply this equation. And the equation is basically that the temperature at any node i at the next time level is equal to the temperature at the same node and at the current time level plus the Fourier number multiplying this expression of the neighboring nodes, including its self-node. Remember the Fourier number in this case is equal to 1, so we are going to find a solution that diverges, certainly. And then we implement the boundary conditions, right, at i equals 0 and at i equal capital I. At i equals 0, we have a second kind condition. So it's basically the temperature at node 0 is related to the temperature at node 1, which we already found through this loop right above uh, at the next time level, minus delta x over k times q0, which is the given value of the flux, which in this case is 0. And it has to be 0 for it to actually uh, correspond to this analytical solution. Because remember, we found this analytical solution for the case when q0 is equal to 0. And... Um, the infinity at L was also equal to zero. So at the right-hand side node, I equal capital I, the solution is um, the temperature at the next time level is related to the temperature at the previous time level, at, at the current time level, but at the node right to the left of it, plus the BO number times the infinity divided by one plus the BO number. And then after all the loop, all the this loop inside the loop is actually done, we return T into the explicit solution. And then we're going to compare it to the analytical solution. So the first thing we do is compare these at time equals zero, right? So we are uh, evaluating these for the nodal, uh, the nodal distribution of temperature is the, is the, are the blue dots um, at time equals zero and at, at n equals zero, which is exactly the same. Right. And as you can see, there's a perfect correspondence. We impose a temperature distribution at time equals zero that was parabolic, and that is what the explicit solution tells me. Well, that's actually not an explicit solution. We we filled up the uh, we filled out the array using the initial condition, so there should be a perfect correspondence between the two. Then we look what happens after one percent of elapsed time, after 0 0.01 of the final time which is 0 0.01 of n, the total number of, uh, of time steps. To see what happens, you can see there's some, the, the analytical solution uh, is, looking for st is looking for equilibrium. The maximum temperature of 100 at the center is going down, and the temperatures on the, on the ends, on both ends, on the left and on the right, are actually not anchored because we don't have a force condition. We have a second kind condition on the left and a third kind condition on the right. Notice the third kind condition is a, is a convective condition. So basically, this end of the domain is convecting the heat uh, with a medium that is circulating around here with a temperature of zero. So this is trying to bring the temperature down to zero or keep it, that, keep it down at zero, but it, it can because it's convecting. It's not forcing it to be zero. Notice the uh, numerical solution actually has it's already showing signs of error. There is a discrepancy here, especially at the, at the end nodes, and that discrepancy is going to amplify very quickly. If we go now to 10% of the elapsed time, of the final time, the analytical solution look is looking for stability, it's looking for equilibrium. The maximum temperature of 100 has come down. Uh, the slope on the left is zero, as expected. And on the right-hand side, see, it's convecting to zero degrees, so it tends to pull down the temperature a little bit uh, more on the right-hand side. But see, the, uh, the numerical solution is completely uh, now uh, useless. The error in the analytical solution has grown. Uh, there's, there's discrepancy between the solutions, and not only that, the error has been, has been amplified to render the solution useless. And even so, we do this at... at uh, at the final time step, when t is equal to t final or n is equal to capital N, and compare the explicit solution to the exact solution. And we don't even see the explicit solution here. Okay. Well, the analytical solution has actually kept uh, uh, stabilizing, 
and finding equilibrium. Remember, it started at 100 right here at L over 2, and now it's going down and down and down. As we increase the value of time, the value of time, these would actually go down to zero. In this particular case, the asymptotic solution is zero everywhere. So this is evidence that with these large of a Fourier number, the solution would, would not actually converge. So what we need to do is either increase the size of delta x, which we don't want to do. So to decrease the size of the Fourier number, we either increase the denominator or decrease the numerator. So we don't want to increase the denominator because we'll, that will make the space discretization too coarse. And it's already very coarse, it's already 10. Uh, the number of, uh, so we have 11 nodes in, in space. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the size of delta t, or decrease the size of delta t by a factor of 10. I'm going to increase the number of time steps by a factor of 10. Now the Fourier number is 0 0.1, and let's see what happens. Obviously, this is going to take a lot more time to evaluate, but it was immediate, as you can see. There is some discrepancy of the solution, especially at the end nodes, as you can see, but uh, that error is not going to be amplified. It's going to be contained now now that the Fourier number is actually within the bounds of stability. So at uh, time equals 1% of the final time, which is 10 seconds, this is what's happening. After 100 seconds, so 10% of the final time, after 100 seconds, this is what I have. The red one is the analytical solution, and the blue one is the explicit solution. There's an error. There's a discrepancy between the two. But the solution is stable now. And as you can see, after a thousand seconds, the solution has stabilized, and the numerical solution is actually quite accurate compared to the uh, to the analytical one. We can actually keep decreasing the size of delta t as much as we want. So we can go here and say, well, I want now ten thousand time steps. It's going to take a while. And you see the error remains the same. And the source of this error here, is, especially at 1% of the final time, the source of the error is the fact that these nodes are way too far apart. There is a, the, the space discretization is too coarse, so the uh, finite differencing representation of the space derivative uh, is not very accurate. So we, this essentially leads to the same type of error. So ideally, I will make delta x smaller, but if I make delta x uh, 0 0.01, now the Fourier number is back to 1, and you see not only diverse, it actually gave me an error, encounter a floating point error. So let's make delta x, um, let's say 50, so delta x is 0 0.02, the Fourier number is 0 0.25, that's within the bounds of stability, the number of time steps is 10,000, so that's it's going to take a while. And this should lead to a better representation of the solution in space and also in time. All right. So time, as you can see, we have more notes now. The solution in time, and at time equals zero, is, as, as expected, is perfect. And notice the solution now, a time equal 10 seconds, of so 1% of the final, so final time, is much better than before. A time equal 100 seconds is much better than before. And a time equal 1,000 seconds is almost identical. So this is a, this is a, a qualitative uh, comparison of the solutions of the exact or analytical and numerical solution um, that doesn't include a qualitative uh, a quantitative representation or quantitative comparison of the solution, which will involve calculating a residual, which you all know how to do from previous examples. So this is all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion on the finite differencing method and more applications in the next class. But for now, uh, this is uh, material that will serve you well in preparing for future assignments and exams. So thank you for your attention, and I'll see you next class.